You know, um, Kate, do you know Mondays are my favorite days of the week? I know it's kind of crazy, but I love our Monday episodes. Kind of crazy. I'd say that's insanity. Who wants to be, you know, Monday's tough, man. Monday's like, uh, you know, everybody's got to start things off. I know you're one of these, like, you know, start off good on Monday, end off strong on, you know, Friday or Sunday, whatever it is. I'm like, I wake up Monday morning and I'm like, how do I find a way to make this either Saturday morning or Friday morning? <laughs> Well, well, I have that thought too, Cage. I have that thought too. But I'm a, I'm a people don't know this. I'm a fat guy too. You know, people think you're a fat guy. I'm a fat guy by nature. But here's my theory. Are you a fat if guy at heart? Could, Are you a fat guy ally? That's what they the allies now. That's a big thing. Uh, they used to call me big body on the soccer field. Okay. But that's because of the ladies that you were with. <laughs> no? <laughs> anyway, I think I have a theory. If you could win Monday, you're going to win the, re- the week. You could carry that momentum on throughout the whole week. Okay. Win I Monday. I, I, the episodes, they always, it's always fun how you start these things off, right? So I'm going to have to call you on this because people tell me I have to press you harder. How exactly does someone win Monday? Like Amazing. I consider, because I'm a fat guy, I consider winning Monday is when I wake up Tuesday morning, not dead. Okay. And I'm like, oh, Before- look what I did. Look at that. I had all that bacon, all that Chick-fil-A, and Tuesday still came. I won Monday. No? Here, here's here, here are my things. Exercise before 10 a.m. Uh, I lost Monday. I lost. <laughs> I lost. I'm losing. I, I lose every day. I lost every day. Exercise journal, eat healthy. If you could do that before noon, you're winning. If you could do a few calls or a few kind of like business meetings, whew, you're just dominating. I had a I had an or I had an early call this morning. I woke up early today. So I definitely, I definitely was, uh, I definitely was moving along a little bit early this morning. I feel semi accomplished. I got a lot of stuff to do. You know, it's funny the way the world works. You can't hide anymore. It used to be, you know, you, you showed up at your desk at 9 a.m. on Monday and you got into your day. Now it's, you know, you wake up at six o'clock um, and you look at your phone and it's like, damn, look what I have ahead of me. Let me, my, I might as well just start, start doing some of this stuff now. You know, like you never, Did you, check really... the ca- you check your calendar. Yeah, I check my calendar, but I check my emails. You know, my emails are like, look, 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 oh my God, I better jump on this now. This way it's not smacking me in the face at 9 a.m. Yeah, you can't hide now. Work is now not 40 hours a week. It's not 9 to 5 Monday and Friday. It's 24 hours, seven days a week now. You, with phones and emails and stuff, you can't escape. What do you – you grew up in this era, Grant yep. Hill. Yeah. So there was a cool post going around, uh, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but it's uh, – I love the segue. Love the segment. <laughs> Emails work is twenty four seven. You grew up. Tell me about Grant Hill. Like, well, okay. well, we, got, we, we got it. We got an episode going. Yeah, so I we can't take the whole time just talking about you know what success Monday. and failure. Like. Winning Monday. Winning Monday is Grant Hill. Go. <laughs> I bet you Grant Hill wins Mondays. If you look at his stats, if you look at his accomplishments, the guy's a Hall of Famer, first bout Hall of Famer, easily. He's a businessman. He's still in the league. What was what's so confusing? You don't think he's a first bout Hall of Famer? Well, when did he stop playing? That's a weird thing to ask. I know his rookie year is 94. That's not I don't... a weird thing to ask. Is he in the Hall of Fame? I mean, you're saying it like he's the first ballot Hall of Famer. You usually say something like that, like Chris Paul, right? He's still playing, and when he's on the ballot, first ballot, he'll make the Hall of Fame. Like, I think Grant Hill's been out of the league long enough where he either is in the Hall of Fame as a first ballot Hall of Famer or he isn't. It's not something I personally know. Is he in the Hall of Fame? So he's a seven time NBA All Star, a five time All NBA. Election, a three-time winner of the NBA Sportsmanship, that's irrelevant. And he was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 2018. I was like that, this. Was that his first year of eligibility? So you asked it like a question. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. You, This is a fact. He either was or he wasn't. You can look it up. Like, this is do, do, you want me to? do you want me no. to? Is it relevant to what we're talking about? I don't know. It, it's relevant to my play. play. He's my play. Okay. I, I led into my play. All right, so we got your play. Whether he was in the first ballot Hall of Famer or he got it on his second or third, he's clearly a Hall of Famer who deserved to be in on his first ballot and probably got in on his first ballot. I'm trying to think. I mean, he was injury shortened. So what, what do they get? Five years after they retire, right? He started playing. If memory serves, he was the 95 rookie. He was a rookie in 95. 94. Um, so, yeah, but it's like a, a, a year. So 92, 93. 
basketball. 94, 95, yes. 94, 95, exactly. This is going to be this kind of episode. No, I'm this just, I'm trying to look, but just like, I remember his upper deck card. I remember his, his 94, 95 upper deck card. Um, you know, and I, I remember him, he was drafted third behind Glenn Robinson Sr. and Jason Kidd. <laughs> So not bad. I mean, kid, that was one of those weird ones where like there's a one and a three and the two is usually the left out one, right? The two is usually like the, the Darko Milicic or the, uh, you know, like, oh, why'd you do that? One and three are good. You know, Sam Bowie, right? It's Elijah Juan and Jordan. But this was not that. Glenn Robinson was one. He was a Greg Oden. So so go for it. Let me hear about Grant Hill. I like Grant Hill. Great, a great college career to add on to the stats as well. And he's in <laughs> – this is such a weird episode. And he's a part of the NBA, like, front office, whatever they call it, now. So – and I think he's going to have a career outside of sports. I'm all disheveled because I'm not even sure where this is going anymore. I, oh, I don't know how many years out of the NBA it takes you to get into the Hall of Fame. I don't know five, those numbers. It's fine. I know cards. I know it's cards. Fine. I know cards and I know accomplishments. And I'm looking at – my favorite card is the 1994 Topps Finest card. I know you love Top's Finest, right? I love it. Yep, I love it. And you could get his rookie card. I was, I was just looking at all-time goats, like just all-time great players. I know we throw the term goat out. Please don't kill me for this episode. <laughs> but, but Grant Hill's a good player. He's an accomplished player, and he's still in the league's front office. And I was just looking at some guys with his accolades that you get cheap that are still relevant. And that's how it brought me to his play. And I'm looking at his rookie year card. Top's Finest with the coding is selling for $535. $10, $11. And I know we had a shortened episode today. I'm going to talk a little about NBA. And I thought that was a pretty legitimate play. Now, I feel like free it. to push back. No, there's no pushback on it other than they made a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, the raw ones are tough. I know there's coding on it. You know, if the plan is to grade it. Like, I'd be curious what a PSA 9 or PSA 10 go for with the coding. And, you know, how these things grade in the whole nine yards. But if the play is just to have a, a raw... Grant Hill rookie, that finest rookie, is a really cool rookie. Um, it was the first they did the coding on it. Um, it's a cool card. I know what the card looks like. You know, it's kind of like the bluish. Um, and um, yeah, for five ten dollars, why the hell not? I mean, like that's a uh, you know. Go ahead. Do you think that other than grading, there there are other ways to make money in the hobby? So sometimes I think that this card could be like a twenty five thirty dollar card, and like I, I think that's possible, but like. It's not really worth it because you don't get as much return as if you were to send that to PSA and get a PSA 9 or a PSA 10. So it's like some cards aren't meant to grade. I think the answer is, is, is grading is the key. And that's why with all the changes and all the crazy stuff that's going on now, it really is you know, kind of like a let's see where we go from here kind of hobby. There are very few cards uh, from the last 20 years that um, are quote-unquote collectible without a grade. Um, because your audio just left me for a second. So How stuff, did that happen? stuff was just made in such high quantities. You know what I mean? Like, and remember 92, 93 was Shaq at Alonzo morning. 93, 94 was, uh, Chris Weber and Penny Hardaway. And this was the year following that. So this was a third straight year of like legit top of the draft talent. You know, I know we like LaMelo and Anthony Edwards, but think of this draft class you're talking about as them, right? You got the Luca Trey, you got the, you know, you got the, the, the Zion John, you got the Anthony Edwards and, and, uh, and, and LaMelo, like stuff is printed now. This is the third year of like high end, you know, stuff. And you, you know, you could argue Jason Kidd, Grant Hill at the top of a draft class is probably better. Who remains to be seen. We'll see what happens with LaMelo and those guys. But but there's no shortage of it raw is what I'm saying. The grading is what creates scarcity. It's sort of like cards in the 80s, baseball cards. You, know, you can buy a, a Mark McGuire 85 Tops card for you know a pretty reasonable price because there's a ton of them out there. But buying one at graded as a 10 is a very different story. You know? So that's... Cage, let me ask you. So um, that's actually the comparison that I had in my head. I'm glad you said it. That like that 92, 93, 94 was similar to the draft class of 2018, 19, 20. But you're still seeing Luca base cards at like 300 bucks. Yep. Why wouldn't someone with an accomplishments of like a Grand Hill, like if Luca would be happy if he had a, a career similar to Grand Hill, right? He'd be happy to have a career like Jason Kidd. He'd be. I, 
I don't think his cards. I think people are paying the money they're paying for Luca for him to have like a LeBron type career, not a Grant Hill type career. I don't think his cards raw state three hundred if he has a Grant. So, so what do you think is more likely? The Luca base prism goes to a hundred bucks, or the Grant Hill card that's right now five bucks goes to a hundred bucks. The Luca goes down is more likely. There is a potential for that Grant Hill. Look, the Coach K is retiring next year. I don't know yep. what Grant Hill is going to be doing, but maybe he turns into the next great Duke coach. I mean, he's not coaching right now, per se, and I know there's a lot of other Duke guys that probably would fit the bill, um, you know, right off the bat. But, you know, I mean, Grant Hill's not going anywhere for a long time. As you said, he's relevant. I see him on TV. I see him doing interviews. You know, maybe he'll get into coaching. I, I mean, he'll remain relevant. Um, and when you're, you know, when you're culturally relevant and when you're still relevant in the sport, there's always the chance that that card, you know, that card goes up. Um but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of them. That's you know, that's my concern. Like, I, I like the '93, '94 uh, finest set alls. The one before it, um, and you, know, you could pick up, you know, Dominique Wilkins cards for a buck. You know, you could pick up, you know, like star cards. I mean, it's not a rookie, obviously, but you know, the, 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 you have to remember this stuff is just it's printed. You know what I mean? And and when things get good, as the hobby was then, people pr- that these companies they printed a lot of cards. Um, so the ungraded stuff, there's, you know, it's supply and demand. And, and I, I think there's just so much supply of the cards that, you know, you'd need a demand shift right now. And it's tough for somebody to have a demand shift like Grant Hill, who's done what he's going to do. You know what I mean? You know, if he goes in, and next week, they announced that, uh, on the undercard of Jake Paul and Tyron Woodley and Logan Paul and Floyd Mayweather, that Grant Hill's going to be boxing Shaquille O'Neal. And all of a sudden, it becomes a more relevant thing. Or, you know, I'm just throwing two names out there, you know, that you could see doing this, you know, sponsored by the general or something, you know. Like, that happens, sure. The card goes from 5 to $10 that day. So, you know, there's the potential for so, that. So then, so then, like, middle tier, go, like, um, middle tier accomplished NBA stars, the Chris Webbers, the Penny Hardaways, the Dominique Wilkins, are they even investable then? How do you invest in them? So, so it's funny, right? I would say two years ago, the answer was no. And you can go back to any of the interviews that Gary V gave, even when he was gung ho hobby. And there was, there were constant refrains, you know, he used to say the same thing over and over again, buy my doodles, buy my doodles, buy my, no, I mean, before that, <laughs> his, the constant refrain that he gave was, I love cards. I buy cards, you know, like I'm gonna, you know, I, I love the cards. I love the rookies, but he would always say, be careful when you're buying the modern stuff. Because look at the price of Ray Allen. Look at the price of Chris Bosch. Look at the price of those guys who, if anyone coming up today besides Luca and Trey have those careers, they'll sign the dotted line for that right now. Any of these guys would take the Ray Allen career, one of the best shooters of all time, win the championship. Anybody of these guys would take that, you know, Chris Bosch career. Somebody, I mean, not the top, top, top guys, not your Lucas, not your Zions. But the rest of them would take that, and yet we're buying like Cam Reddish cards, and we're buying Cam Johnson cards, and people are going crazy on Tyler Hero and the whole deal. That was his point, right? That before, you know, if you look back, those cards they're almost cardboard irrelevant. He never said that because that's my term. But but that's the point that's trying to be made, and it's only in the last couple of years where people have said, "All right, well, if Kobe's this, and Jordan's this, and you know, let's take a step back. Tim Duncan is this. It's, oh, let me look at those Allen Iverson. Well, let me go a step below. Let me look at Ray Allen's cards. Let me look at Chris Bosch's cards. And, you know, some of them remain relevant and have gotten more appreciation over time for as good a player as they are. People like Dwayne Wade, they'll fall into like that 1B. They're never going to be Kobe. They're never going to be LeBron. But look, he's, he's hosting a TV show now, right? He stays, you know, relevant. He was a great player, won championships, you know. Those guys, that notch below top tier, sure, I think there's some investability, some collectability in those guys. But you go a little further down, and no, after their playing days, it's just, you know, it's it's tough. What, what do you look for? Is it stats or accomplishments or a combination of both? Like, the, it's like a, Wade it, has it's, accomplishments it's, and stats. Grand Hill has stats, not, not really the accomplishments. Right, he had some great college. He had some great college. We never won an NBA championship. Um, you know, he's going through the ball into Christian Leitner, by the way, for that big turnaround Kentucky shot. Um, but um, oh, what do I look for? I mean, I always look for the same thing in every single card. That that it that thing that's hard to put your finger on. That when you're thinking about a player or a card or something like that, where you're like, okay, I, I can see this. This has something, right? This has some connection to me, connection to the sport, connection to the world. You know. 
part of why I like the finest set so much is not the cards per se, but it's the first one. It's the first shiny. It's the first refractors ever. You know, it's, it's something that started off the trend of the hobby the way it is. Part of why I like the 2012 prism set is because it's the first prism set, you know, and that that's now got roots, you know, it's the, so I would I love your clay 2012 prism play because of that. You know what I mean? Like it's not just clay. It's you know clay may not ever be the greatest player ever, but now his rookie has that that add on bonus of being in that iconic set. Sort of like the '86 Flair cards. You know what I mean? Patrick Ewing he never got over the hump for a championship, right? He we won in Georgetown. Very similar. I mean, he's a big man. Grant Hill wasn't, but very similar comparison. A lot of college success. A lot of good number compiling in the NBA. A lot of all-star appearances. You name it for Ewing, right? But but Ewing, the collectability for him is that he's in the '86 Fleer set alongside Jordan. People aren't. Buying what would be the next iconic set that Grant Hill, or Chris Webber, or Anthony Hardaway, Penny Hardaway would be in? Yeah, I mean it's tough for those guys, right? So 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 Chris Webber and Anthony Hardaway were in the were in the first year of finest. So their their rookie cards are actually in that '93 finest set. Um, Grant Hill, it's tough, man. Grant Hill, upper decks cards that year. Um, upper deck was weird with basketball. They didn't do SP, you know, like baseball had, um, the Jeter in 93. That was the first year that they did. They did upper deck SP for football and for baseball. So like that 93 year, there was Bledsoe had a rookie in the first year of upper deck SP and Jeter had a rookie. And then the next year, Marshall Falk had a rookie and um, um, Alex Rodriguez had one in baseball. But that 93-94 season for basketball, they did SE is what upper deck called a special edition. And they have these cool like die cut cards. And that, that Johnny Kilroy card that I mentioned in yesterday's episode, that was a 93-94 SE card. You know, a little black border on the card. They did these cool like parallels electric court, I think it was called, where it was like a little shiny in the card. Um, I'm sure my age here. This is the early 90s. And I was collecting. But, um, you know, Grant Hill's tough because by then it was now a couple years in. Finest was in its second year. You know, he, those upper deck cards are really cool. Grant Hill's upper deck card. They have a die cut over the top. It looks like it's cut like the key. So that's a cool one. You know, it's like the first time they did uh, uh, die cuts on the base cards, I think. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else. And it's cool. It's like a gold foil type of card. So that's a cool looking, you know, Grand Hill rookie card. If you look that one up, um, you know, for his upper deck card. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, that's that's probably where I would go with Grand Hill. I love the finest card because it was the first time they had that coating. You know, like the peeling, you know, where you peel the coating off of it. Um, but I'm looking at a 93 Tops Finest, and I know it's Shaq's second year, but his uh, 93, 94 Tops Finest is seven bucks for the yeah. Shaq one. Yeah, which one? The one with the brick wall behind it yep. or the regular one? So there's two cards of Shaq in that set. That brick wall one is kind of like an all-star card. Then there's another one base. That card number three, cool. just the regular one. Yeah, just the regular one. Yep. <clears throat> that's the more valuable one probably too. <clears throat> So Dude, this is cool, Cage. You're like an encyclopedia with these releases. So, so the takeaway here isn't necessarily that it's a Grant Hill play. The takeaway here is if you want to invest in that third tier of you know Hall of Fame NBA players, look for an iconic set to pair them with. So that way you kind of two chip, two ways to win, I guess, so to speak. I love it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I always it. try to find. Are you right? gonna keep? You're gonna keep pressing me on all these plays because that's friction makes diamonds, right? No, I mean it's not pressing, man. It's just you know, I mean, it's look, you could. You could press me on my play. My play might not turn into a million dollar play. My play is more timing, player, you name it, and just something cool, right? So, so it, it's one I don't own in my collection, guys. So you might get some competition from me. I won't buy it over the next like couple weeks. <laughs> Actually, I, I, won't I buy press it. You the cage on mindset. When it comes to <laughs> yes. mindset and, and I, oh, that stuff, the heady stuff, I could press you. How am I going to press you when you have four decades of experience and I'm going into my sophomore season? So, dude, I'm going to ask you while I'm, while I'm giving a play. I want you to look up a card on eBay for me and see if you could share it for our YouTube folks. And I want you to take a look at it, right? So do you know what today is the anniversary of? So it's June 14th, a big day. This was my dad's birthday, actually. Um, it's Flag Day, which is a really cool day. I hope everybody has their flags out. Do you know it's Flag Day? June 14th is Flag Day. Uh, it's American Flag Day. Um, and June 14th is actually the anniversary, 1998, of the shot where Michael Jordan hit that shot over Brian oh. Russell and walked off into the sunset the second time after winning. Oh, you know, this that was that big day where there was a chase with um, 
the chase in the white Bronco, the Knicks. Let's forget about OJ for a second. I'm going 98 with Michael Jordan. The shot. Okay. Okay. You know? Sorry. But, over the, over but the it was right around this time too. Yeah, I mean, it was the basketball playoffs. I don't know if it's this day, but you're ruining my whole, like, the 14th, man. Flag day, my dad's birthday, Jordan shot. So what I want you to do is I want you to type into your e-bag, guys, um, and you can find this. You, you, what I'm, what I'm going to tell you to do here is be cool about your search terms. Search this in different ways, motion, lenticular, um, 98 slash 99, because some people have the wrong year. So what I want you to type in, Andrew, is type in um, 1999, upper deck, Lenticular, L E N T I C U L A R, Lenticular Jordan, and see what comes up. Okay, so this is a really cool card, guys. You know, I'm a fan of like the cool, like, um, texture, different type of cards. You name it. I talk about sport flicks from the 80s. There it is. So, zoom in on that bad boy, right? Yes, so, and you, yeah, and you see, obviously, that that the price on that is a, a Mexican pesos you got there, so it's a little different. Now, now it's back to dollars, right? So, so this is so check that card out, June fourteenth, nineteen ninety eight. You don't have to show the plain white back, but Upper Deck made this card. It's actually made the year <laughs> after to commemorate the one year anniversary of the shot. Now, the picture of this one's not so great. You can see, you know, he's kind of like raising up, but this card, lenticular, it means you know when you when you when you hold the card from different angles, it actually moves. Sort of like one of those like sports flip cards. Let's call it the first Top Shot moment. So everybody wants a Top Shot moment of Michael Jordan, right? Everybody wants a, a motion picture. You get that with this card right here. This one says 114. This one at 15 dollars. This 30 dollars. They're, they're all over the place. But this is a really cool card because it's today. I mean, it's June 14th, but it's June 14th, 1998. It commemorates Jordan's championship shot over Byron Russell, um, where you know he, he kind of left his hand up in the air and won you know won the championship, and this is one of those, like, you know, we talk about cards as art pieces. It's not exactly rare. You know what I mean? It's not the rarest thing in the world. It's Michael Jordan. Um, like I said, you know, if you don't buy it today, where today's probably the, the day where everyone's overpaying for it because no one looks for this the other 364 days a year, right? But I bring it up today just so you know about it. And maybe you look for it in October when nobody's looking for the June 14th card, you know? Um, maybe look for it October 14th instead, right? So, but it's a cool card because... It has the shot. It has Jordan. It's an upper deck branded card. And it's one of those things where, like, if you hold it like this, oh, look, you can see it. it's like an action. It's like him taking the shot. You know, you see him raising up the shot, the ball. It's got the shot clock in the top right corner. You know, it's like one of these cool, like, moving picture card type things, you know, card like art. Do I think it's going to, you know, be a tremendous, you know, money play for you? This is one of those more, like, cool habit in your collection. I love it. It's. Uh, I think I lost you there for a second, but you. You know, you say, how, how can I? Uh, you want me to press you, but how, how can I press you? It's an amazing play. Like you said, it's the it's the first Top Shot moment before there were Top Shot moments. Guys, busy day. We're recording uh, Scouts with Conrad. We're going to be recording another Conrad Uncaged today. So today's episode is a little shorter, 20, 30 minutes. Any final words, Cage, before I let you go? That was a fire play. Those are fire no, I mean, listen, that, that play there, it's one of those things where if you can get it cheap enough today, 15, 20 bucks, make an offer to somebody who's had it there for a while. And, you know, if you can show it off to your friends and hang on to the Jordan card. And then next year, when June 14th comes around, you could probably sell it for double. <laughs> you could still double your money if you want, if you want to get rid of it. But it's just, it's one of those cool things. It's just like, you know, could it go up? Sure. Could it stay exactly the same price it's at now? Sure. Don't overpay. Don't be the one that pays. What was that? 247,323 Mexican pesos. Is that what you had it up there for? Don't pay that. <laughs> don't, don't pay don't pay that yeah i mean listen fire play i mean plays from us have fun with it we're getting a lot of good messages um I, you know i listened to yesterday's episode i don't want to sound negative guys i want to sound realistic and we mix in positive andrew's positive enough for everybody um you know people did i did get a lot of favorable feedback from yesterday saying that you know the world is full of fluff and gumdrops and marshmallows and whatnot and that you know if, uh, we're kind of giving it to them the way that it is when the you know when the when the market is not as rosy as it has been. But I will say this, guys, I do think that there are clearer skies ahead, you know. And I say clearer skies for a reason, not necessarily you know um, flying to the moon on the twenty-eight million dollar rocket ship with Jeff Bezos, right? More of clarity, right? Clearer skies, clarity, because PSA will open back up, right? The markets will open back up. 
the world is returning to some semblance of normalcy. People are going to games. You know, there were a lot of questions, right? A lot of questions, what's going to happen with PSA? What's PSA's pricing? That will eventually be answered. There were a lot of questions about, was this a COVID-driven spike, right? Were people home doing nothing, spending their money on this because they had nothing else to spend their money on? They couldn't go to games, blah, blah, blah. That will be answered soon. And we'll have a lot of our, our questions answered. And I think we're all going to come out of this fine. We may lose a little bit of people who came into this for quick money flips, but I think most of those people are going to stay because the hobby's enjoyable, right? I mean, I have fun with this. I wake up every day thinking, what should I be buying now? <laughs> so, do you, think, do you think there's a thing that, like, we, maybe we coin this term, it's like a practical optimist? Like, you, you, you don't have to just put on r- rosy, uh, rosy shades and be like, everything's good. But you can see the issues or the things that are going poorly, but also have an optimistic view of the future. Can those yeah, two look together? Definitely. Definitely. And I'll ask you to have your regular non-optimistic view of the whole deal. I, we talked about it yesterday after they lost, but um, the Nets, as we speak right now, is still favored to win the NBA championship. I'm sure that's changing. I'm sure that uh, the, you know maybe Harden's going to come back in some some sort. The second is now um, is now I think the the, 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 issue, with the, cage, the issue with the Nets cage is they're not going to be able to get into game shape. So their injuries are I don't think necessarily are injuries of like something crazy happened and they're Harden hasn't gotten into game shape and how can he get into game shape? You know, you can't practice with a hamstring. So he's returning into game shape while playing and that's, and coming back to playoff intensity. It's really hard. It's really hard. Uh, and I, I, it would be interesting to see what happens if Kyrie goes out and Harden and uh, Durant finish the season, right? Will they be as good as they were without Kyrie? Uh, it's just, it's a fun experiment. The sun so, uh, swept the- People got on him, but Buster Hoops Nation, that page posted, a, hey, here's Kevin Durant without Kyrie or Harden. And it was a picture of him with like his 06. It was like an 06 like Hoops jersey, you know, like where like as a kid, he was like, it was like, it was like scrawny arm, like, you know, like a, like a child. Like, hey, he goes back to, you know, playing high school ball, basically. And people were on him. They're like, this is wrong. And, you know, so, but I mean, it's, it, there's only truth, so much right? to do, right? People get on to people because uh, there's a little bit of truth in that. Listen, th- we, we've been talking about Kevin Durant for a long time. I held back a little bit in yesterday's episode, but if you go back to some of my stuff in the beginning of the season, KD was everyone's bet. Like Everybody loaded up on KD. Everybody. No exceptions. Everybody bought in. This was the year for KD. Get your KD cards now. The first time he goes to Brooklyn and drops 50, quote, end quote, people are going to wish they had his cards, right? And Everybody's banking on KD. KD, they get knocked out here. I mean, you'd like to think he would get a pass because his teammates both got injured, and normally you would. But to me, it works the other way. It, it, says, it says to me, KD can't do it without a supporting cast, which is fair. Listen, you could say that about almost everybody, but it doesn't help the narrative for KD. What happens to Giannis's players? cards? Let's say they get out of this, right? I Giannis saw, look, yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I saw a slam stocks chart. We like to give our, our, our friends a little credit. So a slam stock chart showing yesterday, like before the game, saying how um, Durant's cards were down slightly less than Giannis's cards. Or they, you know, they they were doing a comparison of the two of them, right? One was down like 60%, one was down like 50%. They're both pretty down, you know. But yeah, I mean, I would think that Giannis's cards, people would probably start buying them last night. You know, because after two games, you were like dump that Giannis stuff. Now, you know. I mean, you would think maybe, you know, Giannis, Giannis has an inside track here. Um, but, yeah, there's Kate, the chart. You see? Can you see the chart? Right here. You I see Kevin see. Durant's cards? This is yep. right at the end of March, early April. Yep. That, that looks like a pump, right? A hundred percent. That This right here on the chart, this little – what do you call that? Yeah, that – that was that's the middle finger, but that is that is when the golden auction was after that was the auction after the Jordan records. That was the one where like literally every Kevin Durant card that sold in that auction sold for record prices, and everybody was all over Kevin Durant. That 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 was the March 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 was the month of Durant. But what looked like it happened there April May it looks like while while Giannis was getting beat up, Durant's kind of his cards kind of held a little uh, held a little stronger. I think you you might see those two cards kind of flip-flop game five tomorrow is gonna to be huge huge are you enjoying the playoffs yeah man basketball's fun man good for chris paul first time in all of his time he's had a sweep right he's never swept anybody be nice to see that i, I mean you know that's huge for him for his health that might be the single-handedly the biggest think thing about it. you have a week of rest now 
And think about the matchup, man. Donovan Mitchell, Der- uh, Devin Booker. I mean, talk about a nice matchup there. But oh. can, I, can I also tell you? Kawhi's uh, done? No, no, no. He's but you one, Gage. No, can I tell uh, – listen, I, I, I just said that to, to Ian today. I can't wait. You know, I want to see the Clippers make a series out of it. And so does the NBA. Because think of the PR department at the NBA – what they're going to have to do to try to promote a Utah-Milwaukee NBA Finals. <laughs> oh, no. Talk about markets that they don't want in the Finals. The Suns are 3-0 and versus the, the Jazz this year. 3-0 and 1-2 and 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 versus the Clippers. And just because Giannis gets past the Nets doesn't mean he's getting past Mr. Embiid, assuming Philly makes it, you know. I think I think that would be the most favorable matchup for the Bucs that they could get. If they get Mr. Embiid, Embiid is a softer version of Giannis. Oh, shoot. I can't do this. I promise to be a good Philly fan. The Sixers <laughs> are going to cry. Woo! There you go. All right, guys. We love you. We'll talk to you soon. Can I read you one comment real quick? I left. We'll read.